got a Bible with you, hopefully you got some note sheets when you were coming in the doors. Pull out your note sheet. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to go to several different texts, kind of, kind of lay a little more of a holistic theology of calling around three pillars. The first one is that God declares all work to be sacred. 1 Corinthians 7, 17, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them. So, uh, underline or circle assigned to which God has called them. Underline or circle called. Those are two common New Testament terms from the Apostle Paul. Uh, assigning and calling. He, God assigns spiritual gifts to people to build up Christian community. And then God calls people into a saving relationship with Him. So assigning and calling would be normal kind of church language, religious speak. It will be used often in the context of the body of Christ, except for here in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul is applying, assigning, and calling not to ministries within the church, but to vocational work outside the church. He's assigning it to things like social action and employment and things like it's everyday, average, ordinary jobs. He's saying whatever the Lord has assigned and called you to, economic tasks, if you want to insert that, is the application of this. And this is where I'm grounding like all work in God's eyes consecrated unto Him is sacred work. But we're on struggle street with this in the church world. At least I am at times, and I confess I've used the wrong vocabulary through the years. And maybe you have as well. I just jotted down some things that I've either said or I've heard others say as we interact with one another. It's, maybe you've heard this. Someone said, quote, often speaking to young people, hey, I heard about God calling you into ministry. That's so great. I'm happy for you. Or another might say, well, have you decided if you're going to go the ministry route, with like your career path? Or are you going to go the secular route, the marketplace route? Or maybe you've heard someone say, had someone say, well, I work as a sales manager. That's my secular job. But I help lead a men's group at church on Wednesday nights. That's my ministry. Or another person says, well, I'm an administrator at a school. That's like what I do to make a living. But I serve in kindergarten class on Sundays. That's my ministry. Or someone else says, I, I run a construction company. That's my secular job. But I volunteer on the tech team on Sundays. That's my ministry. So what we tend to do is compartmentalize and categorize. But the Bible invites us into a life that's not compartmentalized or categorized. It's an integration of the life. It's an integrated life. In Jesus, you lose the whole concept of a category called secular work or a secular job, and you inherit what's called a sacred calling. In Jesus, all of God's people are called into the ministry. In Jesus, all work is consecrated unto Him. Look at this quote I put in your notes. Eric Cooper, he wrote a super helpful book on this topic, and a friend gave it to me this week. And this quote, he says, this is game-changing news, speaking about all work being declared sacred. Your work, whether you're a teacher, a software engineer, a banker, an attorney, a factory worker, an entrepreneur, a stay-at-home parent, blue-collar, white-collar, if you're a pediatrician, or you work the deli counter at the supermarket, and you're reconciled to Christ, your work is, hear this, a sacred calling. I had a friend this week send me a text, because you know, we ended the message last Sunday with a little prayer of vocation. I hope it was helpful to you this week. I hope you were praying it as you kind of started up your work days each day. And this friend, he had started up his days kind of praying the prayer of vocation, and then he sent me a text, and with his permission, I just share a little excerpt from it. He talked about how that prayer was helping him stay more connected and grounded to God as he was going through his days. And then he said specifically on this morning, he said, as I head to work, I know that one of my first tasks is HR related. And then he puts in parentheses, my least favorite part of the job. Anybody else feel that? And then he says, I am reminded that work is an opportunity to imitate God and Christ which has caused me to shift, hear this, shift my thinking from the meeting being a condemning style to serving justice with kindness. HR doesn't have to be rude, it just has to be corrective. That's what it means to integrate work and worship. 
Do you see that? That's how the stuff we do on Sunday affects the things that happen in the HR meeting on Monday. This young man is just as involved in the front lines of ministry as I am as a pastor in whatever I'm doing. It's no less ministry in his HR corrective conversation he's having than it is with some type of counseling appointment that I had this week. It's all, when it's consecrated unto him, it's all sacred work and equally declared ministry. This is central to what it means to follow Jesus. This is why we've got to lift up all work being his work. And so Oswald Chambers, he says it better than I ever could. He says, the spiritual manifests itself in a life that knows no division into sacred and secular. So my prayer through this series is if we had to shoot a video like we just saw and kind of followed us around with our internal church language, that we'd slowly and steadily remove the categories of sacred and secular and insert what I think the Bible speaks clearly is all work consecrated unto Him is sacred. And all of God's people, as they're called into life with Him, are called into ministry. You're no less in the ministry with what you're doing vocationally than anyone else in a missionary context or a pastoral context or any of the other obvious terms we've attached to ministry. Are you with me? All right, one person is back there. I appreciate that. So... First pillar, you got to hang with me. We got two more to build on this. Second pillar, just laying out a theology of calling, dovetailing it with last week's theology of work to connect what in the world our worship on Sunday has to do with our work on Monday. Second pillar under calling is the story of your life and my life has to find its context and fulfillment in God's great story. Capital G, capital S. Now, Genesis 11 is where I want to ground this point for a moment. Those of you who know your Bibles well know that Genesis 11 is an important chapter that occurs right after Noah's sons begin to populate the earth in Genesis 10. It's called the Table of Nations. After the flood and Noah's sons come out of the ark and they begin to populate the earth and the earth is growing in numbers, people are spreading out, but they share the same language and the same culture and they're cooperating and they're working together and they say, well, that sounds really good. Yeah, they're building a society, and now you're going to see in Genesis 11, verse 4, the story that they're focused on writing. Here's what they're focused on. Come, let us build ourselves a city. That sounds good. With a tower that reaches to the heavens. Maybe not so good. I suspect the tower that reaches to the heavens is one way of saying, in case God decides to, like, raise the water level again, we're going to show him. That's what I think that's all about. It's like, you know, in case he decides to start sending rain, we're going to get a tower. We're going to get it way up high. So it's an act right there of telling you what story they're focused on. Preservation. And look, so that we may make a name for who? For ourselves. Otherwise, we'll be scattered over the face of the whole earth. This is called the Tower of Babel. And I think the Tower of Babel represents something deeply embedded in the human condition. Here's the propensity to go Tower of Babel on the story of our lives. It's to put self at the center to build your life revolving around self, centered around self, starting with self and ending with self. It's the Tower of Babel dynamic in the human heart. And one writer put it this way. I thought it was really insightful. He said, you know, we spend about the first 40 years of our life building a tower, making a name for ourselves, trying to prove our way and make a name. And So about the first 40 years, you build this tower. And then around age 40, God says, jump. And he says, you better be careful how high you build the tower. That's Tower of Babel stuff. And the point here is that God never intended for self to be the starting point or the reference point or the center point of our lives. Listen, the container of self, it's not big enough to hold the fulfillment and the context that your life is longing for. And the more you try to squeeze out of the entity of me, myself, and I, you're trying to squeeze out life and context and meaning out of me, myself, and I. It's not the point. That's not the starting point. In the language of Jesus, Luke 9, here's how Jesus put it. I put it in your notes this way, Luke 9, 24. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will what? Will save it. 
So this is back to last week's point. In the beginning, God. God's the starting point. And we're made in His image. He created us. Imago Day. we're stamped in His image. And because we're made in His image, He's not made in our image, the application would be, the better we get to know who God is, the better we understand who we are. The starting point isn't with self. The starting point is with God. In the beginning, God, we're created in His image. He's not created in ours. So if we really want to understand and get context to our lives, we have to start with God. Self has to find its appropriate place under and in the great story of God. You say, well, why is that so significant related to calling? I put it in your notes this way. This means that the context and fulfillment, hear this, of our lives is received, not achieved. I'm going to say that again because that just went right past somebody. The context and fulfillment of our lives is received. It's not white knuckle achieve. You can't just go put self at the center. It can't just be about me, my, my preferences, my hopes, my dreams, my desire. This life at its core has never intended to be about you or about me. We have a place, we have a role, but if you try to make the starting point, me, myself, and I, and the center point, me, myself, and I, and the end point, me, myself, and I, here's what you're going to end up with. You're going to end up in Luke 9, 24 ter- territory. The very life you're striving to find is slipping out of your hands. You'll lose it. Because God says, no, you've got to start with me. You've got to put your story under the context of his great story. The anchor has always been and will always be God. And we've got to center ourselves and find where we are in the grand, epic, eternal story he's writing. It's not about the small, brief story of you and me. we got 80, 90, 100 years on this earth. That's it. This story's been going long before you and I showed up. This story's going to be going long after you and I are here. So the question is, if you're the center of your own story, that do you see it? That doesn't make any sense. You're trying to extract out of self what self was never intended to be extracted. You can't find fulfillment and context within yourself. And that's a real challenge today, I think, in an expressive individualistic culture that increasingly elevates the role of self around virtually any topic. And God says, no, actually, if you want to understand the Bible's word for calling, you're going to have to relinquish self at the center. You're going to have to get off, you have to climb down the Tower of Babel. You got to get off that tower. You got to say, you know what? This isn't about me and my name and my preferences and my dreams and my hopes. It's about me finding my place under and in God's epic, eternal story. The deeper context of our lives and true fulfillment is received. And the more we try to achieve it ourselves, I think Jesus says, yeah, that's the more you find it slipping through your hands. And I can't think of a better visual today, church, than on this point than our baptism tank. And the seven lives that went into the waters of baptism. And to see some snippets of their story on their cardboard testimony. And to see the expressions on their face. I hope you were able, some of you just recently baptized, I hope you could kind of relive the moment yourself. Do you remember what it was like to climb into those waters? Do you remember the sense of surrender as you went under the waters, united with Christ there and His death, and then come up out of the waters and united with Christ and His life? And these individuals from the youngest to the oldest, are saying to us today that they have found the meaning and purpose, the context and the fulfillment of our life under God's great story of redemption in Jesus. And when you do that, it's into the waters of baptism that you go. At some point, when you've decided your life is not your own, it's Christ, I've been bought with a price, when you've settled that in your heart, Jesus says, into the waters of baptism you go. And you visually and publicly represent what's happened in here. That's this. We've got a group of people now who I hope after the service you're able to greet them and hug them and high-five them and congratulate them and welcome them in to this next step in their spiritual journey and being a part of this family and encourage them to keep finding their identity and their fulfillment under God's great story. So all work, all work is sacred work in God's eyes. Everything that's consecrated unto Him. There's no more categories of sacred and secular 
in Jesus' name. And then the story of our lives finds context and fulfillment in God's great story. Third pillar under a theology of calling is that your calling and my calling is your whole life. Your whole life is your calling. Let me unpack it this way. Look in your notes. The word the New Testament uses for called is the word in the Greek, kletos. Say kletos. Kletos means summoned by God. And so here's where it's used. 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called, kletos, summoned by God to salvation in Jesus. Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has kletos you, called you, summoned you. Or how about Philippians 3.14? I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, kletos me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. So stay with me here. Think about this with me. Our calling is our whole life. You and I, we are called to Jesus. We're called to Christ. That's salvation. And we're called to become like Christ. That's discipleship. We're called to join Christ in carrying out His purposes in the world. That's called ministry. And we're called to love our neighbor, right? When Jesus said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, who's your neighbor? If you're married with a family, it's your spouse, your children. If you're single, you've got friends and roommates and coworkers. It's the people in our lives. We're to love people well. We're called to love others well. And then hear this, we're called to work produce, accomplish, create. That's our vocation. That's what we talked about last week. We're made in the image of a God who is a worker. We've been set with a six-in-one rhythm inside of us. Work, produce, accomplish, create for six. Sabbath, Shabbat, cease, rest for one. All of that, do you see that? Salvation and formation and ministry and loving others and vocation. That's all represented of our kletos. It's our calling. Our calling is our whole life. And unfortunately, we just shrunk it down in the church world. We often use the term calling to those who've been called into vocational Christian ministry. That's too small. It's shrunk down. That's a part of the calling, but it's much bigger than that because all work is sacred and everybody is to find their context and fulfillment under God's great story. And when you do that, you lift calling up to your whole life life. And sometimes you say, well, what about Pastor Eric? Like the Bible, like sometimes God's God's calls like super direct. It is. It's really nice when God's as direct as he was with someone like Noah, right? He said, Noah, build this ark. It's going to take you a hundred years to settle in. You got a long run, Noah. It was really direct what God wanted him to do. Build an ark. Or Abraham, leave your country, your people, your father's house. Go to a land I'll show you. Build a nation. Or Moses, hey, Lead the Israelites out of captivity and slavery in Egypt. Lead them to the promised land. Very specific, clear call. Joshua, cross the Jordan River. Inherit the promised land. Peter, let go of your fishing nets. Follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. A specific and clear call. That's a part of calling. It does happen that way. I find it quite rare that it's that specific. It does happen. You say, well, how do you know if it's happened? If it's happened to you, you're not sitting around wondering if it's happened to you. Like these guys, they know specifically what the Lord has specifically, purposefully at this time, in this place, in this setting, this is what God wants me to be about. Wonderful if that happens for you. Generally, for most of us, it's going to be a journey of discovery. It's going to be more of a process to kind of unpack, like vocationally, where God wants us to invest our six, our working hours. It may be not be as specific as it was for Noah, Abraham, Moses, and the others. I think it's a bit more of a process. It's a little less direct, and we have to sort through it. So I put a little grid that's been helpful to me through the years. I offer it to you. I put it in your notes this way. We can ask questions like, as we're trying to unpack, well, is there something in my calling vocationally, Lord? Is there something specifically you're guiding and leading me to do? Ask, what needs in the world stir your heart most deeply? Do you remember a few weeks ago when Ted was here and he said, what is it that caused you to pound the table, that? Well, where do you find yourself saying, that's not right, that's got to change? It just stirs your heart deeply. Reflect on that a bit. And then ask the question, what gifts, talents, skills, abilities has God entrusted you with? 
Like, what do people who know you well say you're good at? Now, I don't know, you guys who know me well know, I don't have a musical skill in my body pretty much at all. But when I first came to Jesus, I started hanging out with Christians, and it seemed like a really cool spiritual thing to do was we'd get, a, we'd get together, and there was always this super cool, like, small group leader who had an acoustic guitar. And I thought, that was just so cool. And I thought, I want to learn how to play acoustic guitar. So I went down to Mattingly's Music in Newton, Iowa, and I got an acoustic guitar, and I got a songbook, and I started playing, and I started showing up at my small group. Guess what the small group of people, guess what they said? Eric, could you not play, please? It is not helpful to anyone, including God. (laughs) Okay, so here's my point, right? Those who know you well, those who love you, They can affirm what you're good at and perhaps what you're not good at. That's an important part of just kind of unpacking and understanding what is it God's called you to do. What do they see, like how do they see God using you? You have someone say to you, hey, when you do this, it just seems like God really uses you powerfully when you're about this kind of work. Reflect on that a bit. And then thirdly, I put, when you're working on blank, you feel most fully alive. You enjoy it. You find yourself energized when you do it. I roll those three questions together under the banner of Ephesians 2.10. I'm trying to unpack how your calling is your whole life, and there's a manifestation of your calling that is in the space of work and vocation. And to unpack that a little more, I found it helpful to use Ephesians 2.10. I call it my Ephesians 2.10 purpose. Here, anchor this, these words to that. For you have, you are God's workmanship. We are God. Notice plural. We're God's workmanship. If you're in Jesus, you're God's workmanship. And created in Christ Jesus to do what? To do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's not reserved just for the clergy. That's not reserved for just for those who go to seminary or for the missionaries or for the pastors. No, that's reserved for everyone who's in Christ Jesus. You have an Ephesians 2.10 purpose. God has good works prepared in advance for you to do. And so I put in your notes what good works is referring to. It's the word ergon. It means task. Interesting. It means employment. It means action. It means God has set before you and prepared some specific things for you to walk in. And usually it's a bit of a journey to kind of discover that. I mean, I started out wanting to be a meteorologist and then an aerospace engineer. And then I went to school management information systems. And here I am a pastor. Wow, how about that winding road? But you know, it's kind of a process, right? You kind of work it out. And, but listen, meteorology or aerospace engineering or info technology, that's no less sacred work than doing the work of the ministry vocationally. It's all His work. And so part of the journey as we work in through this series is I want to encourage you to step out and embrace, especially those of you younger. We've got all of our students and children here. What a great journey for you at the stage of life you're in to begin to pray and ask Jesus, Jesus, could you just kind of unfold the, your Ephesians 2.10 purpose for me? Could you just kind of birth a vocational vision in my heart for what you want me to do with my one and only life? And don't be so locked in that, oh, it's only like real spiritual if I choose to like serve in the church or go overseas as a missionary. No, great if God calls you you to do that. But it's no less spiritual if you decide to go into the marketplace and move a business forward or go into the arts or go into the sports arena, whatever God leads you to do. If it's consecrated unto Him, it's sacred work. Are you tracking with me? It's no less spiritual. It's no less important. It's no less Ephesians 2.10 just because it's done outside the context of the church. It's good works. It's ergon work he's prepared in advance for you to step into and to embrace. And I think this is a key part of fleshing out our calling. The average American is going to spend 90,000 hours in some kind of a work setting, one-third of your life is going to be spent in some kind of a work setting. It makes sense to me that God is just as active and present in that one-third of your life as He is in all the other elements of your life. Your whole life is your calling. It's not like you're called to Him and you just get a third of your life where you just kind of grind it out in the workplace, and the other two-thirds of your life you're going to pay attention to Him. That's not how this works. Your whole life is His, which includes the specific place you find yourself carrying out a job, 
in a setting with a group of people, tasks and responsibilities, some of them fulfilling, some of them super not fulfilling. And many of you know my story that when I first came to Indianapolis, I came as an employee of Eli Lilly and Company. I came here because I graduated with an information systems degree, a business degree from Iowa State. I did an internship at Dow Chemical the previous summer, loved it. Uh, and I thought, you know what, I just really want to spend some time in the information technology field, work in some kind of business sector. And I didn't know anybody in Indianapolis, but Eli Lilly, this was Prozac glory years. I mean, I showed up at the corporate center and they were like, everybody was just so happy at Eli Lilly during that time. I was like, I don't know, is it like Prozac on the way in the door? What is going on here? But it was just an amazing run the company was going through. At 91, I joined the company in marketing systems and I got put on a project team with the sales reps. This was back before the sales reps actually had these things called laptops in their hands. And I was a part of this team that was going to roll out kind of laptop technology so the reps could like have more digital access when they were visiting with doctors and pharmacies, et cetera, et cetera. And I got put on a great project team. And simultaneously, I'd moved to a city. I didn't know anybody here, and I needed to find a church home. So I met a guy named Kerry Bowman who was starting a church called Eagle Church. And I jumped in with Kerry, and we just started working in the church world. And every Tuesday morning... At 6 a.m., Carrie Bowman, the founding pastor of Eagle, Steve Swinney, who still worships here, and myself. Steve is a physician at St. Vincent. Steve and myself, the three of us would meet at 6 a.m. on Tuesday mornings, and we'd meet at the church, and we'd talk about things that were going on in the church, and we'd figure out, hey, what ministries are going to move forward, and how we're going to keep kind of moving things, and raising leaders, and making disciples, and doing all the stuff that church planters do. And so we were involved 6 to 7 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. Steve's in his scrubs physician gear. I'm in my Eli Lilly suit and tie. That was back when Lilly folks actually had to wear a suit and a tie. Some of you are like, ah, oh, I can't even. That's how it was back then. Archaic days of the early 90s, you know. I was in my suit and tie with Lilly with my little leather briefcase. Steve was in his scrubs, and there's Pastor Kerry. Now listen. The the work we did from 6 to 7 on Tuesday mornings was spiritual work, sacred work, good work, consecrate unto Him. But listen, I was no less in the ministry from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. the rest of my day in my marketing system job at Lilly. I didn't leave corporate America to go into the ministry. I was in the ministry while I was in corporate America. It's the context of it was being carried out differently. Steve Swinney, it was no less spiritual what he was doing working with patients for the next 10 hours of his day than when he was meeting with Pastor Kerry at 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning. It's all. The calling of our life is holistic. And so there was a point in my journey three years in, I loved what I was doing at Lilly. I worked hard. I enjoyed the people. There were frustrating elements like any job grinded out stages. I remember it was like the first year I was on the job, I was sleeping in my cubicle once a quarter because I struggle with drivenness. I have a hard time turning it off. I have a time shutting it down. Project needed to be cared for through the night. I volunteered to stay through the night, so I slept in my cubicle once a quarter. That wasn't super fun, but I did it. And I just kind of kept plugging along. And along the way, Eagle Church was growing, and we got, met Kendra and I got married, and we started a young marriage ministry, and So on like Wednesday nights, we'd have a bunch of young marrieds in our apartment. We were learning married life together and hanging out together. And and then all during the week, I was working as a systems analyst at Lilly. And then on Sundays, we were doing the church plant. Now listen, all of this to say, what Kendra and I were doing with young marrieds on Wednesday nights was no more spiritual than my project team meeting on Tuesday at 3 o'clock. It's all consecrated unto Him. What calling is my whole life. And somewhere along the way, three years in, God nudged me and said, hey, Simpson, vocationally, I want you to take a step. I want you to step vocationally out of corporate America at Eli Lilly and step vocationally into pastoral work at Eagle Church. That was a vocational step. But what I'd like to do is help with our even language or even how I refer to it. That's not the day in 1994 when I got called into the ministry. I got called into the ministry the day I said yes to Jesus. When I went into the waters of baptism and came up and said yes to my whole life, that's when I got thrust into the context of ministry. And the outlet for it has been Dow Chemical or Eli Lilly or now Eagle Church for the last many years. Are you tracking with me? 
This is a theology of calling because God has declared all work to be sacred work. And in Jesus, we find the context and fulfillment of our life. We receive it. We have to step off the treadmill of, I'm going to drive my life and discover my life and build a tower, make a name for myself. we got to get off the tower of battle. we got to say, no, actually, I receive what it is, my context and fulfillment and calling. I receive it from Him. And then I understand that all of my life is embodied in my calling, not just what I'm doing specifically in the name of the ministry or a vocation. It embodies all of it. So worship team, why don't you come on back up? We're going to wrap up. I got one final quote and then an application for the week and then I'm done. Okay, so the final quote, I left it in your notes for you because Tozer, I love Tozer and I really feel like he did a great job with this line here. He says it this way, for the Christian, it may be said that every act of his life is or can be as truly sacred as prayer or baptism or the Lord's Supper. Stay with me here. To say this is not to bring all acts down to one dead level. No, it's rather to lift every act up into a living kingdom and turn the whole life into a sacrament. It's not what man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It is why he does it. The motive is everything. Let man sanctify the Lord God in his heart, and he can thereafter do no common act. That's a theology of calling. That's where we're just going to slowly dissolve the categories of sacred and secular and bring them all under the banner. It's all consecrated unto him. So in your notes, I left you the prayer of vocation again. This week, I'd like you to as you begin your days, pull the prayer of vocation out. Take a picture of it, put it on your phone as you're driving in the office, as you're getting going in your school. Students, as you're getting going in your... Students, you have just as much of a calling in your student years, right? To be present to Him and represent Him and honor Him and what you're doing and how you're doing your work. That's part of your Ephesians 2.10 purpose now in these formative years. And students, your vocation right now is most of it in a classroom setting. But then some of you have additional part-time jobs. Use this prayer of vocation. Pray through it, and then I want you to add one question to it, and I put it in your notes. As you finish the prayer, I just want you to whisper a prayer as you head into your day. And the prayer is this. Lord, what's on your heart today? What's on your heart today? And then spend the day seeing if he just reveals a little more what's on his heart to you as you're going about your every day. You just begin to see a little more clear. What's on your heart today, Lord? What's the burden that you're carrying today, Lord? As you step into that meeting, that conversation, that project, the, whether it's mundane work or fulfilled, Lord, what's on your heart today? And that you put me in this place at this time with these people, and because my life is consecrated unto you, all this work is sacred work. And my story finds its context and fulfillment in his great story. And that my calling is embodying the whole of my life. Because all of God's people are in ministry together. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you. What great visuals this morning of people in the waters of baptism. Our kletos, you summon us to spiritual life. Thank you for that. And maybe this morning there's some being stirred as you watch the baptisms and maybe it's your yes to Jesus moment in the quietness of your heart. You can just say yes to Jesus today. Just say yes, Jesus. I hear your call. I sense your tapping on my heart. I just say yes to you. Or maybe it's a yes of coming back. Maybe you've known him before. You've known him for a long time, but you've been distracted, drifted, just caught up in a lot of other things, busy with life. And today you're just like, you know what? It's just clear to me, I just got to get more centered in my walk with Jesus. And so you just come back. Just, just say yes to Jesus. Just come back to him. Just kind of a returning to the roots that you have in the foundation. Just say yes. Or maybe today your yes is to the 90,000 hours you're spending in a work setting. And it's saying maybe your yes is, you know what? I'm not going to leave Jesus kind of in the car and then get up and go into my workplace and my work set. No, I'm going gonna, 
by his grace, I want to live an integrated life. I want to be present to him and present to my work. So would you help us do that this week? Would you help us pay attention to you and represent you well, that you'd fill us with your spirit, that you'd help us be a light. The words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart, and the work of our hands, I pray, would be pleasing and fruitful in your eyes. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.